yeah, so let me call to order the April 15th meeting of the West Sacramento City Council and Redevelopment Successor Agency and Financing Authority. Uh, we are meeting tonight uh, by live teleconference pursuant to Governor's Executive Order uh, N-29-20 uh, to reduce the spread of COVID-19. Members of the public have been asked to uh, uh, participate in the meeting by a live stream um, or by uh, cable channel 20 on wave cable and to have submitted uh, comments in writing uh, to the city clerk by the commencement of the meeting. Uh, so Madam Clerk, would you please call the roll? Yes. Mayor Cabaldon. Here. Mayor Pro Tem Sandine. Here. Council Member Guerrero. Here. Council Member Ledesma. Here. And Council Member Orozco. Here. All right, thank you, Madam Clerk. That brings us to item 1A, which is uh, presentations by members of the public uh, on items that are not on the agenda. Madam Clerk, have we received uh, no public comments under item 1A? That is correct. All right, then we'll proceed to item 1B, which is Council of Communications. Are there reports or other communications this evening? Council Member Guerrero. Hi, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I have a couple of reports um, of conference calls that occurred in the last week. Um, the National Water Race Conference held a conference call to discuss uh, certain issues that are um, coming up in Congress. And some of the things that were discussed were related to uh, addressing the $500,000 threshold, which disqualifies ports. And so they are looking to address that in Congress, in addition to payroll tax credits so that local governments can qualify for tax cover credits for paid sick and family leave and also make the Port Authorities eligible for the Paycheck Protection Program. Um, in addition, they would like to see included a $1.5 billion um, aid uh, for Seaports Grants Aid Program and uh, $4.5 billion for the Corps of Engineers Coastal Navigation Programs. And in addition, there's upcoming hearings that will be addressing um, uh, a number of issues in um, WERDA. And so those um, hearings are going to continue as planned. And um, their uh, Senate Environment and Public Works Committee is still planning to hold um, the April 20th hearing um, on their draft uh, Water Resources Development Act. And um, the, it will also include the U.S. Army Corps of Engineer issues. Um, in addition, um, the Sacramento Valley uh, League of Cities um, had a conference call on Monday. And uh, we discussed our upcoming tours. Um, and so those are all up in the air, depending on the shelter in place orders that are taking place. Uh, we also discussed uh, some of the things that happened in the state budget committee and um, all the League of Cities activities that are um, being actively engaged, including um, the sales tax uh, layaway, which is uh, going to impact cities uh, funding sources. And that concludes my report. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mayor Pro Tem Sandin. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, the Valley Clean Energy met on April 9th. All these meetings are virtual, so <laughs> I don't have to say that. Um, and the board approved a power purchase agreement with Rugged Solar and heard updates on operational adjustments due to the COVID-19 crisis. And then Yolo County Housing met earlier today, and we are required 2020-2025 five-year plan and 2020 annual plan, along with related capital plans. And we approved a mid-year uh, budget revision. We also postponed reopening housing choice voucher and project-based voucher wait lists due to the COVID-19 limitations. It's, a, it's not possible to have face-to-face -face interactions with potential clients at this time. That's my report, thanks. All right, thank you. Uh, Council Member Roscoe? Nothing to report. Oh, all right, thank you. Uh, I have a couple of reports. Uh, first, the, we've been, uh, through the U.S. Conference of Mayors, uh, we've been uh, negotiating um, with the congressional leadership on the next uh, the next large relief package, um, and uh, I know Supervisor Viegas is in the in the room, but we are right now in a bit of a fight with the National Association of Counties. Um, we have a proposal that uh, Speaker Pelosi and Senator Schumer has put for have put forward that would increase um, CDBG funding by fifty four billion dollars. Um, uh, the, the, the first round of the, of the relief package increased the CDBG allocations by about $2 billion. So it's a very significant change. Um, and that, that money would go out by formula, uh, the, the CDBG formula. And uh, so the estimate is that we would receive about 16 times our normal amount of CDBG funds um, uh, as the principal mode of, uh, of relief. So that, 
that's a it still requires the approval of the whole Congress, including the Senate, which is where it will it's it will run into the most challenges. But um, that's a significant uh, uh, significant appropriation. So uh, I want to also acknowledge uh, Congresswoman Matsui in between getting married, also uh, joined as a co-sponsor of that proposal, and she's been very helpful in advocating it and, and making clear our needs to Speaker Pelosi and her colleagues as well. So that's been um, really helpful and important. Uh, I also uh, um, participated uh, today in uh, uh, the first meeting of a new national task force on um, recovery, uh, pandemic resilience and recovery. And this is a task force that is uh, working on uh, uh, one of the, the central components of the, of the main proposal that is now out there for uh, let's do about the next stages of the of the of, uh, countywide and statewide and national responses. Sort of what what do you do after uh, shelter in place, um, and how 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 soon can you move out of shelter in place? And I know the city manager is going to cover some of what the governor has gone over, but um, uh, the governor number one on the governor's list is is this strategy, um, and it has got the support of most of the public health experts and others in the, around the country as well. And it essentially is massive, massive, massive testing, um, rapid testing, um, including testing of folks who, who are, are, are showing no symptoms or other illness, um, uh, but testing on the order of two, per, two to three percent of all Americans um, every day, um, including randomized testing for workplaces and schools and, and, other, and other locations. So matched with um, massive contact tracing, um, um, more intense than any public health offices do contact tracing today, but also for many, many more people, given the amount of testing that would be being incurred. So ramping up contact tracing by uh, 100 or 200 or 1,000 or 2,000 times what it currently is. Um, so a, a really significant increase in the amount of contact tracing that's going on, then leading to um, supportive isolation. Uh, uh, so I, 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 I learned this morning that, that quarantine is just the word that we use when uh, we're think when we're talking about folks who who for, for whom we don't know whether or not they have been affected with the virus, but if you have been affected, and so contact tracing and testing would show this, then you would be in support of isolation, but different from the situation we're in now, where there would be a sort of wraparound services, guaranteed protections at, at at work, care, other things that would be supportive of that. That's the that's the consensus uh, direction that the country is going in in terms of the public health community and also as I said what the governor has said we have to have be able to do that before we can exit uh, a, a broad scale shelter in place so a national task force has been convened of, of um, the folks from the military and the public health communities uh, Harvard and several major foundations and then uh, I think five mayors from around the country to work on the deployment part of that of that strategy. So if if the testing um, kits and materials and swabs can be manufactured and distributed um, at the scale that that strategy calls for, then how how do we get them actually deployed in communities? Um, because uh, you know two thousand uh, contact tracing efforts or three thousand tests in a community like ours really can't be done through doctors' offices and the and the community care clinic. And the public health office at the county. It requires it requires retooling and repurposing all sorts of other existing um, systems and institutions and people. Um, and the 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 only way to do that rapidly and at scale anywhere is through local governments. And so with counties and cities and others are taking the lead. So, but nobody has scoped that out before. And so we're now working to try to figure out what will that take, what will it cost, and then where um, where where can we begin? Uh, because that's not an effort that can happen nationally all at once. And, uh, and so they've asked a few of us to, 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 that represent cities that um, know how to get stuff done <laughs> um, to, to, to see at different sizes and scales um, to, to participate in this effort. So I'm, I'm participating with the mayors of uh, New York City and Columbia, South Carolina and Oklahoma City and, and several others, a diverse range of uh, five or six cities throughout the country to, to put that effort together um, and aligns well with what we're trying to accomplish here at the state. So we had our first meeting this morning to go over the strategy and identify some of the key initial hurdles and scoping exercises um, for that. Uh, I also, uh, I'm also participating in the, uh, a joint um, um, crisis management seminar for mayors that's being put on by uh, Harvard, uh, the Bloomberg Foundation and John Hopkins uh, Public School of Public Health on a weekly basis. 
Um, and in the most recent session, our, uh, the focus was on mental health, both in the community, but also the mental health of folks in positions like ours, um, and, and particularly our staff and others, and how to, how to, how to cope with uh, some of those issues. But as I say, also for the public. And, and so uh, one of the issues that, was, that we discussed pretty extensively um, that hadn't come up before with the public health community was the, uh, and we, but we have talked about it here before at council, which is um, the in intense stress that comes from continuous adaptation. And so the, the, the tendency that we have in public policy um, and in politics, frankly, to want to keep deploying new initiatives every second and new policies and whatever. Look, I'm, I'm doing something for you. We're doing something. We're doing something. We're doing something that that can have the pernicious effect of raising people's stress um, and reducing their well-being. Um, um, and so one example was the whole evictions issue um, that we talked about in, in the Harvard session, which was that, um, you know, you have to, we, need, you, we want to think about as you consider like changing eviction policies every three days, like is the improvement worth the amount of uncertainty and constant thinking about eviction, number one, that you cause people to go through, and then second, uh, causing people to be confused about what's really going on. So uh, these have been really useful sessions, and I know some of our, our staff team has been participating in them. Um, as well, um, but we're really getting down to brass tacks. The other issue that we raised there was um, how to deal with um, the issues around uh, contact tracing, but also education and mobilization in particular cultural and ethnic communities without um, causing the challenges that Mayor Pro Tem Sandin identified way back at the very beginning of this. Um, so how do you, in addition to very targeted outreach and communications inside of a community, how do you also reach that, that community on a broader basis? Um, and so this is particularly, you know, true in religious and ethnic communities where, where, we, where a lot of our public health outreach and, and even our city outreach tends to be through established institutions like churches and, mm -hmm. and that sort of thing. But that doesn't, that often, especially when the churches are closed, but even when they're not, that's not very effective at reaching um, some of the, the, the folks who, who, who have the highest risk of transmission. That is younger people, teens who don't really listen or may not be attending those services or other, or, or other functions. So how do we reach them without call, without calling undue attention to the to the to the name of or the nature of the underlying group? So this has been a challenge, particularly in our county, um, and in our city, trying to get some help in uh, in you know getting smarter about how to how to grapple uh, with that. Um, and then finally, this morning, uh, not COVID related, uh, uh, or this afternoon, uh, um, the, the Department of Water Resources and the Delta Conveyance Authority were were kind enough to do a a full briefing um, on um, their 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 analysis of the western alignment for the uh, for the Delta project for the state water project. Um, they, so the western alignment is the Garamendi proposal, the big uh, Gulf Little Sip proposal that the council and the Port Commission have both have both raised concerns about in the past. Congressman Garamendi um, and I uh, and Aaron uh, Laurel met about this last week. Um, and then today got a full and complete briefing by the Department of Water Resources and the Conveyance Authority. And without going into any of the details, although we have them for any member of the council that wants them, there are some significant um, engineering and environmental challenges to the Garamendi plan. Um, and so although I communicated to, to Congressman Garamendi on our behalf that you know, we're, we're, you know, we're, we're of course willing to continue to, to, uh, you know, to talk and explore uh, with, with him, um, that our, our fundamental position hadn't changed, and it's, it, and it seems, given that given the, the the barriers to the to the implementation of that kind of a project um, that that are showing up in the preliminary analysis by DWR and the Conveyance Authority, that, that they're not likely to be, um, uh, you know, uh, high, high they're not high likelihood alternative uh, alternatives to be considered as the process goes forward. But the comment period on all of that um, ends on uh, tomorrow or the day after. And uh, so we'll see then whether or not it is included as one of the formal alternatives in that process. All right, so with that, we, we have no appointments uh, that we're going to be doing this evening. So uh, we'll proceed then. Oops, I just closed the agenda. We'll proceed to the consent calendar. Move to approve. Second. Okay. All right, it's been moved by Councilmember Guerrero and seconded by Councilmember Orozco that the consent agenda be approved. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none, that motion carries. Uh, all right, then that will bring us to item three, which is an update and actions on the city's COVID-19 response. Um, 
and we're going to tur uh, turn over to the city manager. But I wanted to ask uh, Mr. Manager if, if uh, given that we have two guests on this item, um, to give us an update on one particular um, item um, that's happened over the last week, or that that it would uh, that if, if we might begin with uh, hearing from them before we go to the to, to the meat of the report. Sure, that that'd be fine. We can uh, include that update now if you'd like. Okay, why don't, why don't we do that and uh, and ask uh, maybe Supervisor Villegas and, and uh, Mr. Yaros if uh, you come on screen and uh, Mr. Supervisor, would you mind uh, uh, leading off and introducing the, the update for tonight because it's a pretty uh, encouraging and exciting development. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you for, for uh, having us and uh, it's an uh, interesting time to say the least. So, uh, you know, as you are well aware and the council is aware, uh, Chris Jaros has been uh, running the Broderick restaurant uh, in town for quite some time, and now he's expanding. He's got a couple other restaurants. And uh, with the COVID-19 situation that's occurring, and uh, no surprise to anybody that the, the need for more uh, food is growing, uh, and the challenges with the stay-at-home order, um, restaurants are struggling. And so Chris really wanted to uh, kind of continue to, to um, you know, take care of his employees, if you will, uh, so he was trying to figure out a way to keep them on the payroll and keep them employed at his restaurants. Uh, at the same time, he wanted to give back, knowing full well that uh, he's going to be struggling with his restaurants. Um, and so he volunteered, as many have, to um, to deliver food uh, most recently. And I think, and I'll let him speak to his experience, but I think what he saw and, and uh, what he experienced really touched his heart in a way where he really wanted to double down and bump up his game and provide a service to our community, to our region, to the, to the county as well. And so, um, so he uh, has been pursuing for the last couple of weeks access to a larger kitchen. And uh, no surprise, the, the Washington Unified School District, as you may know, with the Bright Cafe, has an extraordinary culinary kitchen there for their uh, career tech program. And so long story short, the districts, the Washington Unified School District stepped up in a huge way. Uh, basically gave him access to this kitchen and with our uh, food partner and uh, the Yolo Food Bank providing uh, much of the food, Chris has been able to uh, keep his employees on staff essentially working for free. Well, he's paying them to work to make food uh, for, uh, for residents uh, throughout the county. And so, um, so we're very excited about the prospects of what this can do given the increasing numbers of unemployment and uh, the numbers of folks who are lining up to get through our community. So uh, I'll just, I'll, I'll leave it at that and let Chris talk about his experience. Welcome, Chris. Oh. Oh, you're still, uh, you're still on mute. Now, can you hear me now? There yep. we go. Let's see, it always happens to me. You know, I'm better off in the kitchen, you know, I'm better with a spatula than I have a microphone for sure. <laughs> but, uh, but anyway, um, yeah, so, you know, one, I want to say thank you to, to, to Oscar and, and obviously Washington Unified for, for really working hard to, to secure that kitchen. Um, you know, we were, we, we consolidated restaurants recently, uh, closed West Sacramento just because uh, Mind Midtown had the most density uh, for us business-wise and kind of moved our West Sac team over to Midtown to run the Midtown store and we put the West Sacramento, or, or the Midtown team were our executive chef on this food program. And essentially, you know, uh, we started with, uh, you know, industry folks. And because, uh, you know, right off the bat, industry folks were out of work. A lot of the front of house folks that, that couldn't get unemployment right off the bat uh, needed, you know, needed meals. So we started making some meals for them. And then I, I talked to a couple uh, people that were, you know, that owned uh, senior facilities. And they kind of told me about the plight of the the seniors and, you know, with them now being, you know, at, at high risk, uh, a, a lot of them were supporting themselves by going to the food banks or, you know, for instance, the one that we were dealing with on the Sacramento side was um, a lot of those guys were going to Lowe's and Fishes to supplement their meals. So not being able to do that, um, you know, it started with a story from, from one of my friends and he said, hey, I have, I have a, a couple who told me that they were trying to spread a box of mac and cheese out over three days. And, uh, and that's really where they were. They were at the point where they just weren't, they had no access to food. So, um, so the seniors were, were really kind of our first focus. And then we were made aware of the folks that were, were staying in hotels um, in the, on the West Sac side. And, and then obviously started this partnership with Yolo Food Bank 
Um, and they've been fantastic at helping us, uh, you know, uh, get stuff delivered. And we've even used uh, their cold storage to, to freeze product. But um, right now we're probably starting around, I'd say probably around 3,000 meals a week to uh, um, two families in, in the, you know, the West Sacramento area, Yellow County area. Um, the, the, the goal is, uh, you know, hopefully, because I think the need is around four, there's around 4,000 people. And obviously that's, that's 4,000 people that need meals several times a week. If, you know, so the goal is to, to, to ramp this program, program up through the school um, and maybe get 10,000 or so meals out a week through the, the school. And it's really just a matter now of, uh, of, of, you know, really having channels for product donations, you know, Yolo, Yolo's doing the best they can for the Yolo food bank, but they, they, they have limited resources also. So um, we're just kind of pulling from all over the place. Uh, Del Monte Meats in West Sacramento was, was fantastic. And they, they're continually to, continuing to, to feed us. I mean, I think they probably fed us 3000 pounds of, of proteins at this point um, to, to, to help supplement these meals. So, so right now we're just, we're, we're just looking for resources, you know, and uh, you know, I don't know if there are any other companies in, in West Sac, um, maybe be Rayleigh's or anybody else that has, that has product that they might be able to push into the program. But, you know, we, we can keep ramping up with labor to keep making it, but you know, access to the, I, I don't have the financial means to purchase a lot of this stuff. So, so we're just taking, you know, and trying to, to turn these donations as, as quickly as we can. And, I think that for us on our side, we'll be, as long as, you know, we're able to take advantage of the PPP loan, we should be okay on the labor side. Um, you know, we're just, we're just taking it kind of day by day, but at, at the end of the day, um, you know, uh, I think from what I've seen, I mean, some of my experiences with the, with the, with the, the families in the hotels, it's similar to the, the story with the seniors where, you know, we, we, I went to visit one and, uh, there was a, a, a mother and two kids and, and they were trying to spread a box of crackers out over, you know, two days, literally um, just that's all they had were crackers. So, um, so I definitely feel like, it, it, you know, it's really important right now that we, that we be, get behind this and get behind the, uh, the food bank and, and making sure that um, those meals are being provided. I think that's what I got. Uh, Council member Roscoe. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Just wanted to uh, extend a, a huge thanks uh, to you, Chris. Uh, obviously, I mean, we all know who are in this meeting right now. This isn't your first, you're not a stranger to, to service in this community. Um, but you're right. I mean, I think we are have a little bit of more specialized knowledge just because we're on the, you know, we have access to this information. But there are a lot of folks out there that aren't aware of um, how the vulnerable populations are sequestered and, you know, that, that stepped up, um, you know, at a significant cost to you, not only for yourself, uh, you know, for your employees, but also for the folks that you're serving. I mean, it goes a long way. And so on behalf of our council, I just really want to extend a, a heartfelt thank you to you for being such a, a fantastic community member and, and business leader. Well, we appreciate that. And, you know, West Sacramento has been very good to, to my, me and my team. So, you know, we, we just want to continue to work with you guys and see if we can, you know, make, make some lives better through, through this process. Great. Oh, oh Council Member Ledesma. Thank you. And Chris, uh, A, you brought one too many Chris's into this council meeting, but uh, it's great to see you. And I know you've been working extremely hard. I know we've caught up a couple of times in the past week. And I, I just want to say thank you. Um, you. Your dedication to our community has been there from the very start. And not many people know that when you open the restaurant, you just really got engaged with our community and our chamber and events and just helping the community. Um, and uh, I know these are tough times uh, for our business community. And I know uh, for you, but to see and, and for your businesses and Broderick and West Sac, but I know uh, some of the team that you've uh, been able to retain uh, are helping in this effort in the mid, out of the Midtown location. And I know you're working hard to, um, uh, to try to keep this going. And I guess, I, I guess a question or maybe an ask is sort of how to follow up so that um, we know, I know we've talked and, and you mentioned Domani Meats as one local uh, business that's helped in this. But uh, how else can we help you? Um, and 
either by way of, um, uh, you know, through promoting your Go, a fun, GoFundMe campaign or whatever, because it does take it does does take cash to sort of get the food to you and then back out to the the community and the folks that need it. So I just a I want to offer whatever I can to help uh, to help to help get to that the goal so we can expand it. It benefits us all. It benefits our community and. And this is, I know, a large part being funded out of your own pocket. And um, but we're here to help. And so, whatever other ways you can think of us, how we can help uh, through our own means or through our own channels and networks, I think that's that's at least what I'm offering. So, but thank you again, and it's good to see you. And I'm sorry it's under a condition where where you're not functioning and and serving burgers to the community in general, but you're then doing something so so much more valuable at a time of need when we're all. Um, uh, quarantined up, and a, a group of people can't get the can't, can't get the the access to food. So, I just want to say thank you, Mr. McGrath. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Chris, just want to say thank you for being out here tonight and sharing your story and what's happening. Um, it's good to know, you know, what you're doing and how you're continuing to provide a vital service uh, to um, our residents, our community, especially in, in a time of need and crisis. And you just pulling it together, coming out creatively and establishing um, a, a core service, a vital need for our residents um, is, is heroic. So, and your creativity just to pull that together and even maintain your staff. Um, Want to continue to see what we can do to help and support you. Um, just uh, let us know, just give us a list, um, send us an email. Uh, pull it just we can help we can go and reach out to whomever you think we need to um, continue to help support with your efforts and really appreciate all you're doing. Thank you. Thank you. Sandine. Thank you. Uh, Chris, I want to echo the thanks and I really want to thank you for inspiring people. When our community sees someone like you doing what you're doing and and being so resourceful and creative, it it helps um, folks think about what they can do. And so you're just really inspirational and um, and you're making a huge difference. And so I just wanna echo the thanks and also to our county supervisor for, um, for all that the county is doing as well and for the partnership uh, with you and with, with folks that are trying to make a difference. So we're really proud of you. We continue to be proud of you and um, thank you. Yeah, everything's already been said. I, I, uh, I mean, this was no surprise when when uh, I started to hear about it. And Supervisor Rodriguez said something, and you saw Chris. You shot me a, a photo of it, and I'm like, "What's going on in this picture?" Um, but you were already collecting and distributing food a uh, long time ago now. Um, and uh, but as everybody else, it was no surprise because from the very beginning, like from the opening of Broderick, uh, the the restaurant, um, you know, the just the care. From that, from that, from uh, the, the, the long before opening day, I'm like, I want to be, I want to do right by this neighborhood. I want to do do right by this place. I want to create a a sense of place and a sense of pride. Um, and then I want to create a gathering spot that everyone can, can enjoy. And, I, and it's just always about, um, you, know, you know, you're in the business to serve others. Um, and then, as has already been said, the chamber and every possible activity in the community, um, volunteering, supporting everything. Um, you're probably one of the only people that at least, not me, but I think at least three people or their spouses on this on, in this meeting have Chris Yarrow's costumes, basically, to dress up as you, um, that, which is a pretty amazing tribute um, <laughs> in a community like ours. So uh, just really ex extraordinary. And then to, 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 you know, the outcomes in terms of, like, amazing hot food, right? There, I mean, there's so much food distribution going on. We know this, uh, you, know, um, you know, we all see each other. Um, on this council, at at food banks and food distributions, a lot, a lot, uh, all uh, you know, every other day together. But the uh, but hot prepared, you know, chef prepared food is so important to the sense of dignity and hope and completeness. Um, and you know, you know, it's not like you're living in an institution, but it's still home um, and it's still a community, and somebody cares, um, and it makes such a huge difference. And uh, so I just. Thank you. Thank you for everything that, you, that you're doing. And as, as, as uh, has been said, the, the inspiration for everyone else. And, and as our supervisor, we haven't had uh, in one of these meetings yet. We had uh, our supervisor was with us at the very first meeting. Um, uh, so maybe I tricked him a little bit to get him to come tonight, too, just to, to because we've been working so hand in glove, the city and the county, 
um, on everything. Um, and so the, co the coordination um, has been perfection between the, these two agencies um, on homelessness, on, on, on health and outreach, on the, on the implementation and enforcement of the health order, on the development of the health order, um, on all these, the systems of food, uh, food distribution and everything else, it's been extraordinary. And then you can't um, you can't go around town um, on any day without seeing Oscar, um, without seeing you and and probably Katie, your wife, you know, out there doing direct service too. Um, I think we've all been at food distributions with the food bank and or the Yolo County Children's Alliance or someone else. All of us have, um, and at every single one, we always see you. Um, and you were there before us. You're there when we leave. Um, and the 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 modeling of of uh, genuine uh, service and commitment to to each other as neighbors in this community um, that you've been doing has been um, again no surprise we know who you are but uh, um, has been just absolutely fantastic and I think the one of the results is people in this community now understand the county much better <laughs> like what is what is your I know I pay my taxes to those you know, my property taxes go to Yolo County but what is that thing. And uh, you know more than probably in a century, people understand um, how important the county is and how important your leadership and your service um, is is in our own lives and in the protection of our community and those that are the most vulnerable. So thanks for joining us tonight. And and I know behind the scenes that uh, both you and Mr. Yaros have been working through. You, you've described that you know great partnerships and all of that. Great partnerships take a lot of work, uh, especially under moments of stress and where everybody's running in a thousand directions. And so I know both of you have been working in addition to the, all the stuff that's visible and getting the food and the cooking, but just the, all the rest of the stuff underneath that has been a, a tremendous amount of effort. And thank you for stepping up to do it and sticking with it and making uh, Chris's dream for how to be, how to, how to serve um, into, into, into a reality that's going to make such a difference in our community. Very good. Thank you. Thank you for having us. All right. Thank you. Thank thanks you. so much. Thanks both of you. Thank you, Oscar. Really appreciate it. <laughs> thanks, Chris. Thanks, Oscar. All right. So, Mr. Laurel, we'll turn it back to you for the for the formal presentation on item three. All right. Thank you, uh, Mayor. Uh, just a quick note on that. Um, this may seem small compared to the overall effort of that program, but I did get an early heads up from it um, uh, from uh, Supervisor Viegas, and uh, we at least committed to there. There's um, some fees involved with the school district and renting facilities. Uh, we can't offer our own facilities. We don't have a commercial kitchen, uh, but I did uh, at least commit uh, for the city to help with that effort if needed. Um, sounds like that got worked out, but uh, but yeah, like like everyone said, this this effort is extraordinary. Uh, it's been in the works for a while, and it's a it's a huge part of what uh, is happening on the overall food distribution effort um, in the city. So um, I'm going to take the items a little bit. Um, in a different order than how they are presented in the staff report, just for simplicity. Uh, the first item I want to talk about, uh, well, first let me back up. This is now, I believe we're in our uh, sixth week uh, since we held the emergency council meeting. Um, so we, we've been doing these reports on a weekly basis. Uh, we have one action item tonight. Uh, we have sort of a workshop format for another item, and then I'll go ahead and give a brief update um, on the attachment one uh, piece, which includes all of the to these actions uh, related to COVID-19 response since we started that effort. Uh, so first I'm gonna take up the item that is the action item uh, concerning uh, the suspension of the vacation cap accrual for uh, employees. Uh, this item is being proposed because currently uh, employees, given the fact that they have to shelter in place, have no practical way of utilizing their vacation time. Uh, so many employees are, are already starting to hit their cap. Uh, we have a cap for uh, good reason, so we don't allow uh, it to get excessive. We want people to use their vacation. There's lots of reasons for that. But in the current time, with an inability for employees to use it, they're they're losing that benefit. And so the proposal is simply to suspend the cap for those employees uh, through the end of the year. Um, the labor groups that affects are in the report, uh, but basically it's all the employees um, that that have this issue in those groups. Uh, at the end of the year, they'll need to be back under the cap. Uh, so it's really that simple. It's it's just to suspend it for the rest of the calendar year. And then we would reinstitute it um, as of 2021. So, um, City Manager Amanda Berlin is available if you have questions on this item. And like I said, this is the only action item uh, for this meeting. So, I'll turn it back to the council. Are there questions on this one? Is 
that everyone uh does everybody want to be recognized in this or did <laughs> nobody's on mute so i'm not sure if you went back on oh. after the last presentation <laughs> does anyone wish to be does anyone have a question on this or comment no nope. i just i just have a quick comment to thank Aaron for thinking thinking about you know doing Thanks. something um, effective for the staff thank you so much for doing this Aaron. Uh, absolutely. This is really uh, driven by the HR division, so give them the, the credit for uh, noticing this. So uh, I'm sure it's appreciated. All right. Yeah, so, so I'm supportive of it, too. Um, I, I, I don't look forward to seeing too many of these, though, until uh, before we deal with the fiscal situation. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we're, we are at a point, I think, now where uh, GDP is down 10 percent. Uh, unemployment at 15. That's national. Uh, some of the other numbers are higher. Um, uh, folks that work for government aren't experiencing it in the same way um, because they're, 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 they're just the economic dislocation hasn't been as high, um, but it's severe. And um, uh, you know that 10% down, that's, that's versus 4.3% during the entire Great Recession. Um, so that's, it's, it's massive. And uh, uh, you, know, some, you know, some of the forecasts are you know, it, it, that it will be equivalent or may already be proportionally equivalent to the Great Depression. So we have got to be, you know, fully prepared for, for you know, some serious fiscal issues. And as I think the B reported today, but also the Department of Finance released last week, um, the state's fiscal condition is, is, already, is already turning problematic. And so looking at, at significant cuts and, and so, uh, so I'm definitely supportive of this because it, it's a short-term um, issue. Um, but uh, but yeah, other any other issues around you know employment and and, and labor and costs like that, I think you know, we definitely will, will need to need to, to wrap into um, the, the the meeting that you have uh, set later in the in the cycle for looking at budget um, and administration issues. Yeah, that's definitely the plan too. So we uh, have been having meetings, and finance division and HR are um, working on all sorts of projections and other um, information. Uh, to include that item. So right now we're looking at most likely doing that in the uh, second week of May, but uh, we may introduce the topic um, at the May 6th meeting, but we're definitely mindful of everything you just said. So, um, okay, so I, I did wanna make a quick note also, we did have some uh, slight technical difficulty with the streaming um, a little bit earlier. Um, so it cut out for a while and it came back on. Uh, it's working now as far as I know, and uh, we are recording the meeting so anyone that missed um, the, the minutes that went by uh, when it wasn't working can can pick it up uh, tomorrow when it's posted. So I just want to let you know that. Okay, so um, the second item uh, in the report, and like I said, it's not an action item for tonight, but it is um, proposed as something that the council uh, is recommended to consider, but we would appreciate uh, your feedback on it tonight. It has to do with the YOLO COVID-19 relief uh, initiative and related fund. Uh, so as you know, uh, COVID-19 has really challenged the short and long-term viability of the nonprofit sector, all businesses really, uh, but in doing so with the nonprofit sector has put a, a key part of the social safety network uh, at risk. So many of those nonprofits are already active in uh, the COVID-19 response, uh, providing all sorts of social and human services um, on the front line of the emergency, ranging from uh, medical to food distribution and everything in between. Um, others may not directly be on the front line, but nonetheless, they serve an important role in serving disadvantaged populations or in education and in the overall culture of uh, Yolo County. So uh, nonprofits right now are challenged to maintain their viability um, through this time. And because of that, Yolo County and the Yolo Community Foundation put together this initiative that's now called the Yolo COVID-19 Nonprofit Relief Initiative. Um, it's described in detail in the staff report and also uh, included the attachments um, that are the action plan and a summary of the initiative. But there are three main components of, of what it includes. Uh, the first is technical assistance uh, for nonprofits and things like making grant applications, um, also financial management, things like that. The second is a fundraising campaign that's countywide uh, that both uh, engages potential donors, but also educates um, those uh, donors about nonprofits in Yolo County. And then the third component, which is the main one uh, for tonight, the topic for tonight, is the relief fund um, that's uh, set up to make grants to uh, local nonprofits. So we've been quickly learning more about the fund and its proposed operations. Uh, some of that detail is in the action plan, but we've also been provided more as the foundation has moved forward with uh, organizing meetings. Um, I was able to have a, a quick call today with uh, the, the foundation um, uh, 
CEO who uh, or director that walked walked through some of the questions we had. Um, I've asked Tracy Michael, our Parks and Recreation Director, uh, to be the staff representative on what they're calling a steering committee, uh, which is described in the in the action plan. Um, the idea for that committee is it would include staff. It's a staff level uh, committee from the participating jurisdictions. Um, it's their job to review grant making criteria, to review the grant applications, and then ultimately the way it's set up is they would be uh, making um, selections uh, in coordination with um, a, a leadership advisory committee um, that is set up to inform and shape those decisions. It's made up of elected officials from each jurisdiction um, and other stakeholders. And that committee's primary purpose, as it's described, is to identify the needs in the community and service gaps and assist with uh, the donor education uh, campaign and, and uh, donation campaign. Um, Council Member Sandine, Vice Mayor Sandine, is, is uh, designated as our representative on that committee. Uh, she's been invited to participate in what I think is the first meeting of that committee tomorrow, uh, where they'll discuss uh, their role moving forward. Uh, we've already raised some concerns uh, to the foundation staff about how the governance structure is organized, um, how those uh, the criteria and priorities are set for the grant making, and how we go about to ensure that geographic equity can be accomplished uh, once the grant funds start to get awarded. Um, if we can address those concerns uh, to the council satisfaction, anything else uh, the council has uh, in terms of direction tonight, it would be our recommendation to consider an initial funding contribution um, at a level of $25,000. Uh, that would leverage $250,000 from Yolo County that seeded the fund. I've talked about this in other meetings that give you an update uh, from before, but since that time, uh, just last night, the city council of Woodland approved a $25,000 contribution. Davis had already approved $50,000. And I believe some uh, the expectation is some participation from winners uh, will also be happening. Uh, there's also ongoing engagement with uh, Yochidehi, uh, with Kaiser Dignity Health, Sutter Health about their potential participation on some level, even if it's not financial. I don't have a lot of updates there, uh, but they are still uh, being engaged. Um, we did ask about some of the, the questions that were raised in terms of uh, what the overhead uh, for this effort might look like. Um, and, and also how the funding is going to be distributed. Uh, because like, like I said before, it's both a, a focus on the organizations that are, that are uh, responding to COVID-19 and serving the community in that way, but also to maintain the viability of nonprofits at large. So the way it's broken down, uh, the way it's proposed is that 75% of the, of the funding would go to uh, COVID-19 related activities, so nonprofits that are providing some sort of relief related to the emergency. The other 25% would be for um, funding for other nonprofits. Um, the overhead though is actually um, being done in conjunction with the SAC Region Community Foundation. There's an affiliation between the Yolo Foundation and, and SAC Region. Um, they'll be managing the funds uh, for grant making and uh, post-grant activities um, like tracking and reporting. Uh, there's a 2% fee for that. So I think that describes the projected overhead, some of the other costs. I believe are being uh, absorbed into the foundation's operating budget, but uh, that's the information I received on, on that point. Um, on geographic e equity, um, I think that can be accomplished with grants to nonprofits that uh, both are directly located in West Sacramento, but also that serve West Sacramento. As you know, many of the the big nonprofit, the larger nonprofits in Yolo County, and some of the smaller ones too, they serve uh, multiple locations, multiple cities. So. Uh, for example, the food bank is, is countywide, and there's other organizations that are um, other examples of that. Um, so I think that that can be accomplished in that way. It may be more difficult to accomplish the uh, geographic equity on the 25% uh, of the funding, um, that side, just because of the, the sheer number of nonprofits in the county um, that aren't in West Sacramento. Um, so that, that is a concern that we, we still have raised. Uh, so tonight, like I said, I would think of this as a as a, a sort of workshop on our participation. Um, staff would appreciate the direction about what conditions would be needed for the city to participate. Um, and any other feedback you might have, um, we're not being we're not you're not being asked to actually make an appropriation tonight. If if there is a willingness to do that, we would come back at a later meeting uh, with a budget resolution um, for that. And then also, I'm sure um, Vice Mayor Sandine uh, can take the feedback from this meeting to that first meeting of the leadership committee tomorrow to address any of the concerns uh, raised by the council tonight. So with that, I'll turn it back to the mayor uh, for questions and comments. Great, thanks, uh, thanks Mr. Laurel. And I uh, uh, also wanna thank uh, Mayor Pro Tem Sandine. Uh, we're, we're very fortunate uh, on our council um, 
Well, actually, on the last item that we heard, um, I, I know he's going to talk about it, but uh, anytime somebody in, in our community or in the region talks about the PPP benefits and that sort of thing, Councilmember Ledesma has been, uh, you know, one of the, the key figures nationally, but also helping, you know, business, local businesses one on one, uh, to, to to take advantage of that so that they can stay open, continue to make payroll, and keep, you know, employees and their families um, safe and healthy and, and and eating and everything else. And, uh, we're just really lucky that, that he's a part of the leadership of this community. And then on this issue, um, you know, account, Mayor Pro Tem Sending is one of the leading uh, philanthropy um, and donor um, experts in the entire region, having been the, uh, the vice chancellor in charge of all of that for UC Davis, for Los Rios, and having been executive director of the Yellow Community Fund, uh, Foundation, um, and many, many others. And so uh, we're just we're very, and so her expertise in supporting nonprofit organizations and the and, and and doing so both with a full heart but also with a clear a clear headed mind <laughs> um, and set of uh, you know expectations and guidelines um, is is extraordinarily useful and so uh, I, I just want to say thanks for for devoting the time to make uh, to make this um, make this project move for, move more forward. I do want to you know I think I raised at the last meeting and Aaron re referenced this. Um, for me, there is a there is a fundamental um, governance challenge here. I, I've also been a foundation program officer as well, and this structure is I, I recognize it, but from a city perspective, from a democratic government perspective, it's problematic. Um, so the, I mean, just to, so we're clear, the the fund is a, it's essentially a donor advised fund, right? Uh, uh, Mayor Pro Tem Sandin, the legal control of this fund um, rests not with any of the cities or the county or the steering committee or anyone else. So. Everyone associated with all the government, all the all the investors um, here are don't have actual legal control of the funds. So the other names of all the other entities and committees and stuff that are involved, um, you know, we should just recognize that that ultimately it's I think it's the Yolo Community Foundation or maybe it's the Regional Foundation that has the legal legal responsibility um, uh, for these. Um, but um, in no other domain do we do we permit there to be a governance structure in which um, a, a group of elected officials, in this case, city council members, are advisory to a group of staff um, that re that reports to them. So, in this situation, the the sort of the top of the pyramid is the steering committee, which is comprised of the designees of city managers, um, and then underneath that, essentially, without a, without a formal responsibility to do anything other than go raise money, is the is the policymakers themselves. Um, and the issue is partly about like who gets the grants for sure. That is a that is a policy question in mo in most cities that have even, even when we had mini grants here in the city, the council approved the mini grants um, directly. But more fundamentally, things like uh, seventy five percent for direct service and twenty five percent for um, uh, for rent for you know capacity and for sustainability. That's a policy decision. That's not a, that's not an implementation or execution decision. And those those sorts of decisions, if it's going to be um, you know, the, the, the the taxpayers' dollars of the cities, uh, since we don't have grants from Sutter or from from others in order to support our participation in the fund, those those policy decisions need to be made by the policy makers of the of the communities that are involved. And so we have this inverted governance structure um, that is contrary to, to every structure that we've ever set up in, co in cooperation with other cities um, in the county. So to me, this, that's a sort of a fundamental problem. Um, there's no constitution. No, there's no work that's been done that depends on this. So it's easily fixable if um, if the if the if partners were 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 to choose to go in that direction. But I do think that's a, a pretty fundamental uh, one. Uh, you know, and it partly relates to the fact that you know the 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 board of the foundation, the so the legal entity with the responsibility here. The board of the foundation, I, I believe, is it's nine members: four four from Woodland and five from Davis. There isn't a single one from West Sacramento. So we can't we can't depend on the actual legal entity to be to be looking out for our interests or for the investments that we might be making um, because the, the the foundation's board is does not include not not just not proportional representation of our community but I, but at least according to the web none um, at all and uh, so that getting the rest of the governance structure right is becomes um, becomes even more important uh, you know we we also have a local community foundation here in West Sacramento. Um, that could potentially be an alternative. We wanted to make those investments, but I do. But this governance question is, is is first and foremost in my mind. The second is I just you know I think we we need to be clear from the outset about what our intentions and our plan is here because 
um, as we were talking about in the last item, um, uh, we are, we're, we've already moved off of the notion that the city government is going to be able, going to have the capacity to, to step in and rescue everyone and everything outside of our own domain, because we're going to be in a position where if, uh, if our situation is like the state of California and others, that we're going to have to grapple with the potential for cuts in basic services that we haven't seen since the recession. And if we are charged with responsibility for massive contact tracing and testing as well, the, 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 the possible that the expenditure demands on the city are going to go up dramatically. So I do think it's important that we, that w as we, if, if we move forward in this direction, either through this fund or through the West Sac Community Foundation, that we are not sort of, we're not, we're not, we're not, this is not our anti in to some set of future investments um, because we're not likely to have those. And we, and we shouldn't be making a commitment that we're not, that we're not able to keep um, in the, in the, in the long run. But, uh, but I, I'm only a second level player in this one, uh, having worked for a couple foundations, but Mary Pro Tam Sandin is the expert. So, and she's been doing um, all the work on the, and the, and the collaborations with the various partners on this so far. And, and tomorrow, so let me turn it over to you, Mary Pro Tam Sandin. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. And uh, we do have our first leadership advisory committee tomorrow. And that is when this, um, I think the effort publicly is launched, grant making efforts public launched tomorrow. That's the current um, state of things. There, there definitely is a need, as we all know, for support at this time for the business community, our citizens, and of course, not nonprofit organizations that serve West Sacramentans. Um, clearly, clearly the need is there. And, and they, as we know, the county has stepped up to initiate this, uh, this fund and to get kind of get the ball rolling. And is thank you, Mayor. Um, I do I do have a background uh, and have served as a board member of Yola Community Foundation as well as its executive director. And I'm also a fund holder um, uh, right now. So I I I do understand the uh, operations of the community foundation and its mission. I um, I put my city hat on though through thinking of this and not as an individual donor. What would I personally how might I personally approach this? And that led me, um, in addition, you have a very fundamental question I think, I think we should all discuss and think about. But I think before this comes back to us next week, and Aaron and I, um, Aaron through, or city manager through the representative, um, Michael on the, on the advisory committee as it, as a current, organized and, and myself, we may be able to get at these questions and some of them the city manager mentioned. But for me, um, what's really important, and, and you've mentioned this, Mayor, is, is what will the funds that we contribute support the needs of West Sacramentans and help nonprofit organizations that serve West Sacramentans? We're, we're known as a city that leverages um, grant opportunities. We, we we are always looking for ways that, that we're leveraging our resources. So with the city hat on and thinking about our contributions to a fund, how, how do we know that we can do that? And I think, um, Mr. Mayor, you've mentioned some of the potential limitations, but if we could answer that, like, is there a possibility that the contribution forward will be leveraged? And what does that look like? How can we be assured of that? Um, I think that's a question that we really need to ask directly and and have some kind of answer if if that's possible as we're contemplating this. And then, of course, uh, another question is who else will join the cause? Right now, it's the uh, county uh, and three city or two cities, and and we've been approached and another another city. So I I think we really need to be thinking about who else. And I I think that was contemplated early on that there would be other institutional investors. And I think that's how that's written. So I think we really need to understand that more. Um, and that I think that leads to your comment about uh, potentially coming back to the same sources, but we, we need to know, is this, is this a, a fixed amount that is just the contributions of the government and et cetera. And then all the other concern, concerns you mentioned about, um, and I've thought about us at some point, thinking a year or two years from now is potentially being in the position that the 
nonprofits that they're dealing with now, our, our issue may come later where we are faced with um, not having the uh, resources to, to or, or coming up with very difficult decisions that are happening more quickly with nonprofits. And then what, um, what does the effort cost? And I think the city manager um, mentioned the, the cost of the fund um, and the cost recovery fee of 2%, but um, what, what is the cost of the whole effort, the uh, advertising, et cetera, et cetera. And the reason why I, I, I know because of my work in this area that it does, it takes money to raise money. But we have, with our hat on, we have the obligation to be transparent to residents. And when we're making decisions, you have to be able to say, oh, we put forward this much. It costs us much to, to do the work. And that left so much to actually go to not go to the organizations that serve our community. We need to be able to answer that. So I feel like we just need to be getting a little more information with regard to if if we were to contribute, obviously how much comes back to West Sacramento nonprofits, and then what it is the whole amount? Are we expecting the whole amount plus, or is there something lesser? We just really, in in my opinion, need to have more understanding of that. Um, and I think those are my first set of questions. I I I'm really interested in. I, I know how important the sector is to our community. Um, and I, I, I just wanna make sure we're very transparent in how we're approaching this, um, this question. Okay, thank you, Mayor Pro Tem Sandy. Thanks for your leadership on this. Uh, Council Member Guerrero. Yes, um, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I, I do have a question. You referenced um, having a, that there is like a local foundation. I think there's a West Sacramento um, foundation and just asking if you know um, in your work, Babs, uh, tomorrow what the differences will be. You know if they have um, if they benefit um, di different organizations, so they both are effective um, or are they dupli duplicative in some way? So just in looking into that, if you can provide some more um, background on that, thank you, Councilmember Rosco. I just think on top of that, I mean, the, the question is, you know, how much of that money is coming back to West Sacramento nonprofits? But even for me, it's a little bit more. I mean, I don't mind necessarily. It's not a deal breaker for me that it's a West Sacramento nonprofit, but rather that the nonprofit that is serving the community, that, that the money would get back to people in West Sacramento. I mean, because like, you know, Yolo Food Bank isn't necessarily a, a West Sacramento nonprofit, but yet, you know, hundreds of people are coming and getting food, you know, and so, you know, I, I know you anticipate that, but that's just my, my perspective on that. Member Ledesma. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, uh, Mayor Pro Tem Sandine, perhaps for all the work on this. We have the right person and you're already thinking about um, the, the right questions. Um, I, I am supportive of this uh, as well, um, but I, I too have some um, uh, some things you're thinking about that I want to uh, underscore, and 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 uh, it is around how will the steering committee and the and the governance structure of this set the priorities for this foundation. And I know this because I think we're all reading about it, or you're reading about it about the, the demands that you're seeing. And as the mayor pointed pointed out, rightly so, around um, kind of the state of the economy, um, that the demands for resources are going to be extremely high. And there's going to be a lot of, I think, the way this is set up. But where do we, where do we put those money to? What to what types of what types of nonprofits or what types of other services that our money goes to a pot that allocates that right? So what are the priorities, and and what what are its focus areas going to be? Much like we thought about uh, Measure E or Measure N or what whatever we 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 we've tried to take taxpayer money and focus on priority areas of services. And, I'm, and that's not clear. There's a number of services. And the part I'm just very, very conscious of is just the demand of uh, on these types of um, services. It's just going to be extremely high. And, it's an, and I'm, I'm, I'm fearful of, because we don't have a sense of where we are, or are we at a bottom, what's the new normal, or what, whatever that is, right? 
that that that, that we're never going to meet somebody's expectations with this. And 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 um and so I I, I just that's one area kind of like prioritization. I think you 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 kind of pointed that out. Um, I, I do have uh, share uh, some of the concern around kind of how the local, how, how, how the money will come back to West Sac. And not just a geographic equity, you know, where it's split five, five ways, you know, whatever between as we do in some of our other JPAs or districts. It's, there's, there's a kind of pro rata share that goes out. But it does need to focus on, I think we've learned in the past, is kind of where the, where the most need is. If we have focus areas, areas of kind of where this, how these dollars are allocated, just it's also got to think about kind of the impacts on the on the on whatever we're focused on. So whether it's on homeless or whether it's on food services or you know we we, we take in a, quite a bit of that because we we're closer to the urban core or we are the urban core. So again, there's we have a different set of issues than we have in Woodland or in Davis or in Winters. And no, I'm not saying they don't have but those those sorts of Issues. I'm just. Uh, what I'm suggesting, though, is is that as you as you go forward, that's part of the the the, the thing we have to think about is is think about those priorities. Then that kind of that, that kind of puts together a picture of where where are the where is that problem most uh, most most significant. And then the, the the last one is just kind of related to that. Is just is just it's just making a financial decision of twenty five thousand dollars does not seem like a lot and at the moment. And I'm just being marking it off because the, as the needs grow, the, the, the ask will come back. And I, we don't have any context right now, at least I don't. And um, it's hard. I know we've had these discussions before in council about other uh, issues, financial issues, whether, they, whether it's labor negotiations or whether it's uh, uh, supporting of cap, um, a, a, a capital project, whatever things we're working on. We have some context budget wise what this means, and I know I'm, I'm Roberta and Aaron and the team are thinking about these things. Uh, but as we talk, we're, we're six weeks in, and that data is not there, we don't know what's ahead. And I am looking forward. I looked ahead to the staff report and saw that I think we're looking at Aaron. I think they said the first week of May. Uh, that we might start circling back on these financial decisions, but as time marches on, and without the, con- we're going to have. I-, I fear that this won't be the only ask we have towards something that's important. So um, this is an immediate need because I think we're all uh, ha- have participated in and the food giveaways. We just heard from uh, Supervisor Villegas and 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 the great work that he's done and bringing county services to. The city and, and and making them really visible and, and really effective at a time when we need it most. And um, I, I'm just very cautious of that as as it, the need is the need may be growing. We just it hasn't caught us yet. And so I, I, I'm kind of marking this off for Aaron, really, not so much. And and and, and Babs, as you go forward and this is have that I'd ask that you have that kind of eye on us is because uh, we all have it. I think when we go to our other uh, agencies that we sit on their boards for. Is that we we have to be have an eye on how is this going to impact us financially downstream? Is this are we are we staying within scope? Are we going to be um, uh, caught? Is this a cost? Or while the you know again we we just we just have to be always on this. And the problem we have now is we don't know how where, where we are in this financial situation. And and I'm not I know people got to do their work. We probably have they don't have the right data in from March to see the full impact. We're really going to see it in April. Um, the, the the drain on sales taxes, uh, whether property taxes and are being affected by its collections or by the values, it, it's going to be time. And and so uh, I'm just kind of marking off a kind of a rope line or, <laughs> around the fact that it, when do we when is it time to come back to cities and ask for more contributions? And it just we, we we've got to build in some sort of trigger point or some. I just don't want this to, to feel like we've got this now. Oh, we we've got all this demand because we we we've we've really sunk our teeth into this and look at all the need um, because I, I that's the part I worry about. And so I'm supportive of it. We know we're going to need it, but without any context, it's hard to project how much more we may or need it and or may may be able to contribute. So that's my thoughts. Thank you. I think one thing I'd, I'd add to that because we're, we're four weeks into the shelter order and we're a month into the shelter order. Um, and from the governor's press conference and really from every other 
public health um, advisory that's out there. We're not going to be leaving. Uh, we're not going to be leaving shelter in mass um, for quite some time. Uh, so, so this is this is important and it's urgent. It isn't in in the sense that you know an, a, a nonprofit organization that is about to go out of business tomorrow because we didn't you know we didn't join last week um, isn't going to make it for the next three, four, five, six months. And so as we're looking at particularly the 25% of the money that is for the sustainability of organizations, the right, the, the 75% that's for direct service, that is a critical need, but, and it's going to be a critical need for a long time. Um, mm -hmm. And the 25%, you don't want, I mean, if, if, if you, 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 you want to do, you want to deploy those dollars for organizations that it's going to make a difference for, I mean, to be you know, just like, like, like we triage, in the healthcare system, we kind of have to hear. And if, if, if you can't make it on your own till till uh, till June or July, um, then this is not. It's, it's that, that's not an investment necessarily that, that as a foundation I would prioritize compared to the other organizations um, because we because we're not going to be able to come back every two weeks with twenty five thousand dollars more. We do know that much. Um, and uh, and in, and as as Councilmember Ledesma says, you know, we just don't. We're, we're flying blind right now. We'll know more in a couple of weeks when we get when, when we get our own fiscal report. But we'll also know a little bit more about what the state's doing, what others are doing, and the and the status of some of the, the community non the community nonprofits too. And, and, and if I can, Mr. Mayor, because I know you're you're having conversations uh, with the conference of mayors around uh, even the, the 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 next phase of of the economic package coming out of the federal government. We're, a we're not the federal government. Right, so I, I think about even the funding issues going on at the federal level. We we just can't make up another two hundred fifty billion dollars tomorrow and say, oh, the the, need, the demand is there, so we got to come up with more, and we we can't do that, uh, especially you know given bond. There's a separate flying line, but you also pointed out that you know the current uh, direction at the at the federal level. Uh, is is focused on local government and small local governments and CDBG funding and all those sorts of things that will really help us, but we don't know where we're going to need to deploy that. Right. And and so that that's kind of our point is even though we may be getting all this funding, it's hard for us to make policy decisions around where we're going with that based because because we don't even know what core services may be impacted by all this and in, in in thirty days to six months we we don't know and so. Again, I, there's so much we don't know. It's just hard to like look at look at anything as, as sort of a long term investment. Yeah. Uh, so that, that, that reminds me that, that in addition, the, the so the governor's chief service officer is on the same uh, panel that, that I'm on that's working on this deployment issue, and uh, the you know all the everybody from the Peace Corps has been re recalled. Um, they, all the AmeriCorps folks are right now doing virtual service. Right? There's a there's an enormous core of the formal volunteerism and service um, uh, human capital that's out there right now already. And then in addition to that, there are, are millions of Americans and probably thousands of West Sacramentans that want to get engaged in health um, that are, aren't, that so far we don't have the mechanisms to connect all these folks to support the nonprofits and the services that they are doing, um, but we, we could envision doing that. And as we as we do move to the the, the massive testing and contact tracing, um, you know one one way out for one way to survive and to thrive for some for some of the nonprofits in our community and countywide is to meet is to is to meet the moment as the governor would say, and to think about how the the food bank or the children's alliance or others could could uh, be a part of that solution, which is going to require a community wide effort. And that will come with resources, um, both human and and catch. Um, and so I think you know we have the opportunity to, uh, to to you know to help and work with them with our with our nonprofit sector. That obviously doesn't work for everyone, um, but we have the opportunity to help them connect to the resource to other sorts of resources and changes in the economy that are coming too. Okay. Sorry, I'm not not hearing. Yeah, yeah. So this one's not for action. This I, this particular sub item is not for actions to get feedback from the council, right? For your for staff and for um, Mayor Pro Tem Cindy. Yeah, absolutely. And that was very helpful feedback. Um, we have our um, vice mayor has a meeting tomorrow. Um, 
I know uh, Tracy has follow-up meetings and, and between the three of us, we can uh, make sure uh, the feedback is relayed. And uh, like I said, we'll bring this back potentially at a future meeting. Um, I won't say next week for sure, but um, I know they're looking forward to getting uh, money out the door. So it won't be too long before we we'll, we'll want to be making a decision either way. So, uh, so that completes um, that item, unless there's any other uh, feedback from the council, I, I can move on to the rest of the update. Mayor Pro Tem Yeah, I um I really appreciate the, the feedback and I was taking notes as my as you all were um, sharing your your questions and thoughts and suggestions. Um, but because this is a three pronged um, kind of uh, plan or initiative, it does involve some technical support that's being provided to the non nonprofit community. And so, uh, Mayor, to your point about meeting the moment, I think there is some work, just so you, you're aware that's being done to, to help connect nonprofits in Yolo County with some of the opportunities and to help them with uh, sustainability and thinking about the questions of viability, which of course are um, on, on many of their minds and thinking about even combining forces and thinking differently about what the future might look like. So that there's some some work that's being done through this initiative, but not directly to the fund, the fund question itself that's before us. And then it struck me, if you don't mind my sharing this, that some of the um, issues that were brought up by Mr. Ledesma, uh, Councilman Ledesma, go back to your initial concern about the governance, because some of the questions actually need a governance um, answer. And so I don't know, it, hel it helps to have our representative um, from Parks and Rec on, who was representing the city and that committee on the call. but. Some of the, the some of the questions at the moment in the structure it's in I won't I won't have the um, vote or the authority as it's organized to be able to to change that. So um, with regard to the prioritizations, et cetera, that's that that is not in the currently in the purview of the leadership advisory group here. Um, my understanding is we're going to be asked to help educate the community writ large about the importance of nonprofits and then also to encourage individual donations, um, people to give where kind of where their, they, their heart is to nonprofits that matter to them. So a more, a broader education program. So that's one of the other pieces. But um, I do think we need to grapple with your question, Mr. Mayor, your initial question um, as we as we're thinking this through. All right, thanks, Mayor President. And so, Mr. Laurel. Okay, um, so thank you for that. Um, good feedback. And uh, now I'll turn your attention to the attachment one. I'm just gonna give a couple of updates uh, here, uh, mainly pointing out some differences in the report that uh, we had talked about a little bit last time. Um, get, getting more data from us in terms of both uh, the COVID-19 situation in the county in West Sacramento, but also ongoing um, city services. So uh, these aren't uh, pretty dashboard graphs yet, but I'll be working on that as we go forward as we gather more data to put them into uh, different formats. But what you have before you today is a series of tables. Um, I think the important thing is, is on the first one, uh, what I tried to do is show a week-to-week -week, uh, progression of, of the case development in uh, the county. Uh, today, I, I can update you in the report. Uh, these numbers are current as of 5 o'clock yesterday. That's when the uh, Public Health Office uh, releases new data. So as of 5 o'clock uh, today, unfortunately, we had a, a quite a bit of a jump in Yellow County. Uh, there were uh, 26, um, I'm sorry, uh, 14 new cases bringing the total number in the county uh, to 116. Um, there were also a lot more uh, tests, maybe 60 or so more tests. So uh, there's a total of uh, a little over 11, 1140 now, I believe. Uh, and unfortunately, there were uh, three additional uh, COVID-19 related deaths in the county, uh, bringing that total to seven. Um, in West Sacramento, um, as noted in the report, the only data that's uh, aggregated, uh, that isn't aggregated countywide, 
are the number of cases and the number of hospitalizations over the course of, of time. Uh, so in West Sacramento, there was one new case reported today. So that brings our total in the city to 40. And um, there are still 15 hospitalizations, at least uh, going from the data on the county dashboard. Uh, so I can tell you we'll be tracking that um, day to day like we have been. Uh, we're in constant communication with the, with the county EOC and public health office uh, and watching for trends and uh, more importantly, watching for uh, clusters of outbreaks. And uh, like we've done in the past, when, when those happen, uh, we work with their office to jump on uh, mitigation efforts, uh, including communications, that sort of thing, uh, to try to minimize the, the impact of those. Uh, the mayor mentioned the, the uh, importance uh, going forward of uh, the combination of widespread testing, uh, which we really don't have a good control over, but um, hopefully it's something that's on its way. But more importantly, on the contact tracing side, I just wanted to mention that it's something that our EOC is in the process of gathering more information from the county EOC and the public health office to not only get a handle on what their plan is going forward, but also trying to figure out the best ways for uh, the city and, and other organizations in the city who know it best, and uh, the mayor alluded to this earlier, uh, for how we can be helpful in that uh, going forward. And that's that's not a next week thing or even even it's getting into next month, but it's that's an ongoing uh, effort that's going to be necessary to really start to contain this thing. Uh, so we are engaging in those conversations. It's very early right now, but um, we're uh, definitely um, uh, seeing what we can do to position um, the city and the county uh, to do that most effectively. So that's the data on uh, COVID-19 cases. In that same section, we did include some uh, updated information on calls for service. Uh, starting with public safety, you'll notice that uh, police and fire, uh, fire over the course of the last uh, month or so has seen a little bit of an increase, but, but really want to draw your attention to the last three weeks. Uh, we are trending lower than normal on call volume. Um, that's that's been true for the police department. Also, um, th there's a lot of things you could take from that. I, I think the main uh, thing that we're, we were concerned about was that both we'd see a, a high number of medical calls uh, that would put a strain on our, our fire resources. Fortunately, um, that hasn't been the case thus far. Uh, it's not to say that we're not dealing with challenging situations in this in this environment, uh, but at least the call volume has been uh, fairly steady. On the public safety, on the uh, police side. Uh, the, a bit of the worry was with the shelter in place order in effect, uh, what would be the corresponding effect on uh, calls for service uh, for police services? And thus far, um, it, it's been lower. Uh, we have been watching some key indicators like the number of domestic violence calls. Um, those are also not higher than normal. So, uh, so far, um, that, that hasn't been a, a trend, uh, but we're going to continue to watch those numbers. Uh, the police department has been doing a, a really good job, as they always do, with uh, data collection. Uh, by um, types of crime, uh, much like you've seen in, in previous reports, quarterly reports they do. Um, at a future meeting, we were, we were thinking the, of, of presenting some of that data in a more uh, expanded form, uh, just to give you a sense of some of the trends that we've been, we've been tracking and seeing uh, since the COVID-19 emergency started, uh, compared to where things have been um, on historic averages. So that would be something we would look to maybe give you an update on in, in uh, we're thinking in May. Um, so going on in, the, in that section, uh, public works maintenance, uh, similarly, the calls for service have actually been down. Um, again, there was a concern about with everyone staying home, uh, would have put more of a demand on um, calls for the simple things that, that happen at home where uh, the sewers get clogged and things like that. And thus far, uh, they've been averaging about seven calls a day, whereas their normal volume has been closer to 10. Um, and keep in mind, they're also operating on a on a, a weekly shift, uh, there are alternating shifts, so their personnel numbers per day are uh, much lower than normal. So it's a good thing they're not getting a whole bunch more calls because that would obviously be a lot more challenging. Uh, on the public health order enforcement, that's something, as you know, we have uh, tasked our code enforcement division with being the uh, go-to on that. So they get the calls and complaints and then they work with the county public health office if necessary to make determinations. Uh, thus far, we've received about 40 of those. Um, you can see from that chart that most of those occurred in the first couple weeks of the order. Um, I can tell you uh, from our code enforcement manager uh, reporting that all 40 of those cases have been investigated and concluded. Um, so I think that process has been working very well. 
Uh, the way it's trending right now, it's becoming more about um, small gatherings occurring even in residential areas. So, uh, so we're receiving those, um, those complaints or inquiries from either West Sac Connect or the Code Enforcement Line. Both of those, um, a link and a number are in the report for anyone um, needing that information. The city has set up a call center out of the courtyard, uh, similar to what we do when we have uh, holidays or, or um, the closures uh, during those times. Uh, this is a little unprecedented though, but uh, the staff there really doing a really good job of uh, taking in all the calls that would normally be routed to city hall and the other offices during business hours. Um, typically they get calls like that uh, throughout the day when we're, we're in a normal situation, just because sometimes calls get routed there and then get routed to other buildings. So that's about uh, 35 a day right now. Um, the, the normal rate is about 20, so it's not overwhelming. Um, you can see we, we gave you some information on the types of uh, topics that people have been calling about. Uh, there's a large number of calls in the other category, and I was told uh, today that that had to do with um, their normal calls for service. So uh, some are related to capital projects, uh, some are related to service calls. But in general, you can see it's kind of a, a, a mix across the board. Um, calls related to community development and economic development and various topics are the top category. And we can try to get a, a more precise breakdown of what those have been, if there's interest for that. Um, and then I'll, I'll also mention that this report, uh, for the first time, includes a summary of all the city's activities on social media. Um, as you know, the communications, community relations division has been um, extremely busy. Um, much more so than uh, they're already busy on, on a normal day. Uh, but during this, this uh, emergency situation, they've been, as you know, doing daily updates, uh, but also producing videos and all sorts of other content to be helpful in putting information out uh, using our social media channels. So we thought it'd be helpful to give you a, a picture of, of what that has looked like uh, since the emergency began. So that's highlighted in that uh, communication section. Uh, we'll continue to report on that as, as time goes on. Uh, just to give you an idea of what um, information is getting the most attention among our residents. Um, so uh, I can I can stop there if you like before I get into, uh, uh, I just have a few other updates um, that I could finish. Yeah, I think our intent was to go through the whole, the entire report and then we'll do a, a, a one round of questions and comments. Sure, so yeah, just really briefly, I have just a few other updates. Um, one significant update that just we learned today on uh, related to childcare, I mentioned last time that the Children's Home Society was providing funding uh, for people, uh, essential workers who are in need of childcare. Uh, we received word today that they are now accepting applications. Um, the, the funds are available through June 30th for free childcare as long as the uh, basic eligibility requirements to that program are met. Uh, one or both parents have to be an essential worker under the, uh, the, the state guidelines. And uh, if both are not, um, that one is unable to provide care for some reason, um, and that also their family assets don't exceed a million dollars. We'll provide a link to this information on the city's website and get it out uh, through our uh, other channels as soon as possible, but we just learned that this afternoon. So that's a big help for um, paying for childcare for essential workers uh, during this time. We also, the Home Run Division, um, the, in addition to all the work they've been doing around childcare, uh, they started producing online workshops. I may have mentioned this last week, but I just want to mention it again. Uh, the workshops are uh, geared uh, to families um, that are coping with uh, the stress of being at home and everything that goes with that. Uh, they're being hosted by our early learning specialists and uh, designed to give families information and support on how to deal with that uh, while they're at home. Um, there's information in the report about how we're getting the word out on those. And then uh, I believe the last update I was going to give tonight, which is a quick one on uh, Project Room Key. That's the homeless housing um, initiative statewide, but in West Sacramento. It's been particularly uh, active as of, um, I believe it was on Monday. We had 74 homeless individuals in West Sacramento that are receiving uh, temporary shelter in motel rooms. Um, seven of them are over 65. The rest are uh, deemed medically vulnerable. And that was really the target of this program was to get those that are most at risk of COVID-19 transmission into housing where they can safely isolate. We have a total of 86 motel rooms that the county has put under lease control. Um, and that's, that's a, 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 the number plus the number in the other cities, I believe on a per capita basis, we're way above what the rest of the state's doing. So it's been very impressive to watch that work happening at the county level and with our homeless housing task force on staff. 
Uh, we also are starting a, a countywide group um, of the housing um, specialists that are beginning to work on what happens once that program winds down. Uh, we know that will eventually that day will come, uh, both in terms of returning the properties, but also transitioning the homeless residents uh, once they um, leave the temporary housing. So just a, just a heads up that that's happening. Um, not sure where it's going to go, but we, we felt that it was important to get ahead of that issue uh, before it's um, it's here. So uh, that concludes the updates I was going to cover. If you have any questions about any of the other items, I'm uh, happy to answer. Thank you. All right, Mr. Laurel, thank you. So we're going to uh, do a round of uh, council member questions or comments. Are there any? Council member Guerrero. Uh, yes, um, thank you for that very good update, Aaron. You're doing a great job um, across the board. I did have a question regarding um, the shelter in place, modifying that. And I know the governor earlier this week had presented um, like a, a six part plan and it included um, ha having access to testing and uh, contact tracing. And from what I've read in the Yolo County um, Board of Supervisors update um, that our health officer says we have 0.5% testing as of now. So it's really short in Yolo County. Um, do you, you know, if we're looking at um, future events, you know, such as the state of the city address, um, which are coming, you know, just right around the corner. What are our plans as we modify the shelter in place to have such large events? Because um, the governor was pretty clear that having mass gatherings um, could, could, you know, have a negative impact on the progress we've made so far. So is there something we're doing to track what we can do to modify our shelter in place at this point? Well, let me start by saying that the shelter in place and the decision to modify it at all is um, is at the county level with the public health official, uh, but it's also based on um, any uh, guidance or other directives that come from the state level. So um, any any change to the current order would be in consultation with us, uh, but also um, it really does occur at that county level. Um, I will say, though, in terms of uh, big events that are that are either um, on the horizon or uh, were anticipated. I mean, you mentioned the state of the city. That, that's actually been postponed already uh, by the chamber on a proactive basis. So uh, we do have a slate of other events that, that were on the horizon uh, that our, that our uh, parks department would be coordinating special events permits. Uh, we've already put people on notice and everyone's very understanding that it's very unlikely we're going to be um, having any of those events anytime soon. Uh, we, I, I believe we've actually canceled everything through the month of May for sure. Uh, but, you know, I think it, it stands to reason that beyond that, um, it's, it's unlikely that we're going to be in a place where we can start to have those uh, types of events like the, the marathons that begin in West Sacramento are a good example of that. Those are very popular. Uh, but like I said, we're going to be uh, consulting with the county public health official. Uh, we're going to be following the order um, that ultimately is their decision. Uh, but looking ahead, we've been advising anyone who has that type of event that, um, you know, it's really unlikely that it's going to be anytime soon before those take place. So I don't know if that answers the question, but um, that's, that's kind of how we're handling it right now. It does. I mean, you know, they're, they're, um, the governor's guidance um, was helpful to provide some level of perspective that we're not going to go back to business as usual or back to that normal level of you know, connection that the social distancing is going to be a long-term plan and using other ways to um, connect in public is going to be much different than what we experienced today. Right. And Mayor Potem, standing. Thank you, um, Mr. Mayor. Mr. Laurel, I wanted to thank you for adding, for asking staff and for you doing the reviews of the additional data charts that you, you provided. I. I think they give us a nice snapshot and we can kind of keep on the pulse of, of things and try to understand trends that we're seeing. I hope it's not too onerous, um, but I'm, I, I think it, it's really helpful data. Thank you. Yeah, and I'll say the departments um, typically track that data um, anyway, so I don't think it's a, a very um, labor intensive for them. Um, but also I think it is helpful for all of us, uh, myself included, uh, to see how things are trending. So thanks. Right. Other uh, council member Ledesma. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And thanks, Aaron, and, and the team that's listening in and doesn't have their video showing, but I know you're listening intently. But 
thanks to all of you for your extraordinary work and your perseverance and resiliency on, on keeping things going at the city. Um, and um, uh, it's just, it's showing. And I was looking at the, the data you had brought in, um, uh, specifically the Zen City data, which is uh, kind of highlighting a point that I think the mayor brought up a couple of weeks ago, which is the, the, um, uh, the city sentiment. They, 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 they're supporting the shelter in place, but they're also getting more vigilant around maybe going outside of the shelter in place. And so that seems to be the sentiment. And, and on that note, um, and I know uh, our uh, Councilman Burrell brought it up, which is the discussion around um, um, what uh, the governor had brought up in terms of uh, where we're going. I, I just think it's really important um, that we're just four weeks into our uh, sort of emergency operation. Um, it's becoming more and more apparent um, that the effects of this are are going to be long lasting and culturally significant, um, and I, I feel terrible for the seniors at River City High School who won't have a senior year ending as they traditionally do. Uh, my daughter is included in the, in, 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 the, in the seniors that are missing that, and I know we have friends that are in the same. and And it's it's not easy to think about when we can get back to life. But we have to set the tone. I think part of our, our job is to help lead through this and start to build the cultural norms that things aren't going to be the same. And uh, business isn't going to be the same. Uh, schools aren't going to be the same. Uh, events aren't going to be the same. Um, and I'm not trying to be draconian. It's just, it's just we're going to have to really be vigilant because there will be, a, we, we still don't know what we're going to look like. Um, and I joined the council and uh, at the end of 2010 and 2011, and nobody saw the things we saw coming. Coming, it was it happened in a lot more evolving time. This one happened all in a matter of weeks, and it's it is really difficult in every conversation I'm in professionally and and talking about city business to foresee what what exactly this will have in store for us and what it will mean for life and. Uh, some things um, we'll take for, for the better um, um, that might have changed our lives. But I, I just want to really be careful, uh, Aaron, as you start to think about the events or think, think about just projecting where we're going in the city when we're done with this. I think we just have to manage what we have in front of us. Um, I know we, we will have to address, I think it's the, at the end of the month is when we'll have to, um, I think we gave the, the emergency powers up until that point that we'll have to look at those again. Um, but again, I, I just really caution the, the city to start, you know, just just worry uh, or, or think about and the city staff is to focus on what's in front of us. And a lot of that will be what services we can provide, what, what things need to be impacted, where do we need to be to make sure we're providing our citizens uh, the services they need in, in the most efficient way to help them get through that. And as we learn more about where we are in a month, uh, and uh, we'll address that then. So I just really want to caution that point. But I, I just want to say also thank you. Uh, these are really extraordinary times. I have to remind myself and my team at work, and uh, these are just, just a generation, is two generations or three, have never dealt with this, and um, and we are. And I'm I'm happy to be serving along with all of you, um, and uh, that we have the right leadership at the right time, and. And I'm, I'm very confident with Aaron, you and your team will we'll get through this too. So just want to say thank you for all you're doing. Thank you. And, and I just want to give a quick note on that. Uh, you mentioned the expiration of the emergency declaration period. Um, it was for 60 days. So I believe the expiration is uh, we're looking at May 15th. Um, and that coincides with the May 13th council meeting. Um, we'll know a lot more by then, as you said. Uh, but that's also when we plan to really get into um, information on the budget and uh, so it, it could actually be the, the same the same meeting we could extend the declaration if needed um, those aren't necessarily related topics but um, uh, but in terms of what we'll know we'll know a lot more about that situation we'll definitely know a lot more about the budget that's one of the reasons we're pushing that out a little bit just to uh, give it give it more time for um, some of that information and projections to, to be more sound and and i i not note i, I um, and we can talk offline certainly um, I, I'm just having a hard time waiting until May 15th to have our, have our conversation about what we're seeing. Yeah, we're happy to personally. do it. Yeah. With the council. Um, and not, yeah, and not get in the way of what the actual work. So. Right. Okay. Yeah.
Council Member Roscoe. Thank you. Um, you know, Aaron, since we began meeting, which seems like forever, I and mean, we're still pretty freaking early on with all of this, it just seems like uh, so many weeks passed, but um, you've been so, you're, you and staff have been so responsive to all of our comments and, and feedback, and I appreciate that. And one thing that I, that I noticed um, and I appreciated a lot was the online stress management workshop for families. Um, and I'm sure that that came from some of the feedback, but also just the, the ideas that our staff has about what, what, it, what, are, what is needed. And I mean, we all know, I mean, right now, and every year we're always doing Child Abuse Prevention Month now and doing a proclamation and talking about it. And I don't know what the stats are in Yolo County with respect to this, but again, we are early on and some folks are still adjusting to the new normal. Um, but I, I do appreciate the resources um, that we're putting out there, um, you know, and how we're focusing them on, on families and teens. Um, it, it does occur to me, though, that, you know, there are some families that, um, you know, we put out the resources, right? But it, it doesn't necessarily mean that every child in the community has a Chromebook or every parent has access to online uh, resources, you know, in their home or even, you know, whether or not they would access it. I mean, I'm sure they're culturally appropriate, but even if they would be, you know, there'd be a magnet toward it. Um, but I mean, I, I had a team meeting today where we talked about what we could do um, to respond to, you know, any uptick um, in child abuse cases. And it just occurs to me that, you know, we have organizations in, in the city um, that are reaching out to communities that, that are, um, you know, a little bit more disenfranchised and or um, uh, underserved. That's the best way of putting it. And, um, you know, to the extent that, um, you know, we're doing our thing with early childhood and, and, and um, with our home run division and stuff, but to partner with those organizations that do um, do home visits and get into the homes or, or at least do, um, I guess they're not getting physically into the homes right now, but they're already in an infrastructure for, for reaching folks that would already be at risk um, or at least know somebody who is at risk. So anyway, I just wanted to, to um, say thank you. Uh, to all the staff for all of the, the, the efforts. And the other thing is, you know, um, I, I know that at least the mayor this week has, has gone around the city and, and um, you know, is looking at uh, some of the uh, problem spots and, and some of the great things. I mean, there are so many wonderful things that have rolled out. Um, people that are finding different ways of engaging with one another, whether, you know, it's it's not the way we traditionally do it, but um there are also folks that, quite frankly, aren't being as careful as we would hope. And um, I know that, you know, SAC PD and other law enforcement agencies are now um, going to be ramping up enforcement a little bit more for those folks. Um, at least, you know, not, I don't know what we're doing specifically yet, but um, I know that people in the region are talking about um, really cracking down on folks who are blatantly offending um, the shelter in place order and gathering and, and having, you know, parties in the street and, you know, um, gatherings on the front lawn with absolute strangers. And it just, you know, we, we it's hard because you don't want to, uh, you know, come down on folks for, because we don't know everybody's specific situation, but at the same time, I mean, there are some folks that need to be reminded that, you know, the longer we're doing this, the longer we're going to be in this situation. And so I guess, I guess the question is, um, have we, are, are we um, discussing where we are with respect to enforcement? Um, yeah, I mean, we, we continue to um, be active in the enforcement side where we, we rely on receiving referrals from people. So uh, we're not, you know, we're not at a, we're far from being in a mode where um, you know, there's some law enforcement driven proactive measure put in place to crack down. Uh, what we're doing instead is really uh, putting the resource to um, the West Sac Connect and, and hotline that we, we have set up uh, to make those reports. And we've been receiving them. We've been following up on every one that we've received. Um, combine that with the other efforts we've been doing, um, the simple things like uh, uh, I'll use one example of taking rims down in parks on basketball hoops, uh, for example. We, we are a little frustrated we had to go there, uh, but we, we had plenty of reports and, and evidence of, of people not following the, the order by playing group sports. And so uh, we, we take a lot of different measures like that. A lot of them are in the report, um, give you examples. But um, 
the hope is that we continue to get through this without having to go to a more um, active enforcement um, process. Um, I think some of the, the things that we've been seeing around the country, um, acts of defiance, if you will, um, we, we hope we won't be seeing that sort of thing, but, um, but we're, we're watching what's happening. We're watching and learning from other agencies and how they're responding. Um, and I think we'll be ready for those types of situations that they come up. Um, but yeah, I don't, I don't know if I'm uh, answering your question there, but we're relying on the system we set up more than anything to uh, follow up on, on inquiries and complaints and then doing things proactively as a city to discourage the type of behavior that's uh, most concerned. Thank you. All right. Yeah, I, I mean, I think it, it, the, the governor did this as well. And I do think it's, it's important to reflect on the success that we've had um, as a community. Um, and the you know, cases have gone up and the fatalities have gone up and hospitalizations have gone up, but nowhere near the curve that we were all, that we've all been working together as a community to battle. Um, and, and the key, you know, the case number is a challenge because of, it's so closely related to how much testing is done and where, um, but cases haven't, have not gone on an exponential curve. Hospitalizations grew, but they also have not grown exponentially. Um, and deaths have grown, but, but not, but not even, um, not even a straight line. So, um, there's been a real impact in our community and our county on, uh, of the measures that have been taken and of uh, both by government, but also by individual citizens and small businesses and others in order to, to not just comply with the orders, but to, to, to live up to their spirit um, and to make sure that everyone stays safe and a recognition that any of us can be asymptomatic carriers and uh, that we have to protect our, our uh, first responders, our health workers, and all the other essential uh, uh, folks that are, that are out there, as well as the most vulnerable, most at risk. Um, so we, we have seen you know some significant progress and, and and that's been true statewide as well um uh as the governor said that that's a cause for both celebration and and worry that if, if it causes us to let up uh, because the issues that council member roscoe raised are very real I, it's, she's right I, I biked around virtually every park um, over the last week um it's not scientific because i don't go at the same time every day and, and randomly sample people um uh, and the vast majority of folks are doing what needs to be done in order to, 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 to keep the virus under control and stop transmission. But there are, there are, there are significant and pretty, pretty flagrant violations. And I think the worry is um, uh, that, that everyone in the public health community has is that as we celebrate the success and as we flatten the curve, um, that compliance will go down. And if, and if that occurs, if the sense of we're all in this together, we're all basically in wartime solidarity together diminishes and, and we don't see the same level of, of, uh, com of uh, compliance, then it is going to be absolutely necessary to do you know, strict, even stricter enforcement than is already underway. Right? We cannot run away from that. I know we all want to say to our constituents, don't worry, you're not going to get picked up or whatever. Um, but we can't guarantee that long run if we if we don't maintain the level of fidelity to the social distancing guidelines um, that are that, that are out there and that have worked so effectively um, statewide and in our community. I also really appreciate what the governor did in terms of laying out the six criteria and the metrics underneath them, as well as some additional information that he provided yesterday at the press conference. Because while there is still a lot we don't know about how and when we're going to exit the, uh, this particular intervention of, of, um, of stay at home and, and uh, sort of extreme uh, social distancing, he laid out a set, a set of criteria for how we will know. Um, and that means we can do the same thing uh, and, and locally. So we don't need to be in a position any longer where we're like, well, we're not sure if there's going to be events of a thousand people in May. No, it's absolutely certain uh, from, from the criteria that have been laid out, there will be no mass events of a thousand people in May. That's, we, we know that already. So we're not, we're not doing anybody any favors by continuing to be uncertain about it when we know. Um, and uh, so, so sort of back, walking backwards, reverse engineering those criteria, um, we can see where, where they're headed. We can see when the timing is coming. It's one of the reasons why I, I volunteered to, to, to work on the deployment of the testing and contract, contact tracing work is that that's likely to be the most critical path, uh, the, the biggest critical path blockage in those six criteria. And so until we, until we are able to figure that problem out, we may not be able to relax social distancing in any significant way uh, at all. 
um, but we can look forward to it. And the reason I think, uh, and I'm, I, I'm not, I don't, I, I think I'm in, a, I think I'm agreeing with Council Member Ledesma. It may not sound like it, but, but part of the reason why I want to get ahead of some of these issues and decide, or at least have the path for how we're going to decide them now, is that um, you know we should, if, if we can figure out a, a set of events criteria, for example, now that it relate to what the governor has done. Um, because the governor said he was going to defer heavily to localities in, uh, and, you know, in the health orders and everything else. Then in the summer, in the fall, when we may be grappling with, with you know, where are we going to make cuts? How are we going to deal with maintaining basic services? We're not also grappling with issues that we could have addressed or at least figured out how to address earlier on. Um, so I think both in terms of, of, of looking at some of the criteria that the governor has laid out, we should start applying those and looking at, at I mean, we can see the trends just as well as he can to some extent and start making um, some plans in that in that regard. And then understanding that this testing, this testing and tracing regime is critical. Um, and it's the number one thing on, on that's on his list and on the multi-state compact list for Oregon and Washington as well, as well as for the Northeast um, set of states, that that's number one. And so uh, as the city manager said, readying ourselves to 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 be among the first to be able to deploy that if the if the when, when the the materials and the swabs and the test kits come out whenever we're first in line to do that then we'll be first in line to be able to um to move forward to that next regime which every which all the public health science says will be far less costly to the economy and to communities but also much more effective in in preventing the transmission um, of the virus itself so that that, 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 that that seems like it's a very critical uh, through line for us to be able to deliver on what we know is needed in our community, but also what the governor has laid out in terms of a very clear path, uh, path forward. Uh, Mr. Ledesma? No, I'm, I, I just wanted to, um, we are in agreement. And, and I think that the thing uh, is, is that I want to say is you're right, the markers haven't put out the, the handwriting's on the wall of what it's going to look like, at least the, the pathway of what, what the governor's laid out. Of, of what sort of opening back up might look like, at least the signs of it. So I appreciate and thank you for for uh, volunteering, to take that path. And I mean, I mean, I mean we, we've got to be on the forefront of that effort. And um, we've done that before, about ten years ago, right? And we saw the handwriting was on wall on the wall. And um, and uh, I think at the time, a certain mayor was uh, opposed to a task force that may look ahead and say the right handwriting on the wall, but. Uh, I see you're, you're 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 volunteering for the task force now, which is good. <laughs> so, but I think that's the absolute right thing we need to do. We need to be looking ahead and 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 seeing how we can be at the forefront of it, so that we're advanced. I think that's absolutely the right step. So, and we're we're in total agreement on that. So, thank you. Right. Thank you. Then we have the the just the action item on the vacation accrual caps. Uh, so, is there a motion on that? I'll move to approve. I'll second. It's been moved by Councilmember Guerrero and seconded by Councilmember Ledesma. Is there any further debate or discussion? Mayor, Mayor Pro Tem Sandine? Oh, sorry, you read it. Okay. You uh, read the vote. Okay, then, Madam Clerk, would you please call the roll? Yes. Councilmember Ledesma? Yes. Councilmember Orozco? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Sandine? Aye. Councilmember Guerrero? Aye. And Mayor Cabaldon. Aye. So that motion carries. And Madam Clerk, I'm reminded by that roll call vote that I believe we didn't take a roll call vote on the consent agenda. Is that correct? That is correct. Would you like to do that now? Yes. If, if there's no objection, let's return it to take the vote on the motion that was already made by, by the appropriate means. And would you please call the roll? Yes. Um, Councilmember Orozco? Aye. Councilmember Guerrero? Aye. Councilmember Ledesma? Aye. Mayor Pro Tem Sandine? Aye. And Mayor Cabaldon? Aye. Thank you. Thank you. That motion carries. Uh, so that brings us to the council calendar. Good evening, Mayor, Council Members. Um, nothing really new to report. As I reported at the last meeting, the Wasifka meeting, um, that was previously scheduled for April 16th. It has been rescheduled to the 23rd as a special meeting, and that will be over Zoom. And that's that's it for me. All right, any questions on the calendar? Uh, city Manager report? Just that uh, next week, we will be having a um, 
what I describe as more of a regular slate of uh, agenda items. So that it is a regular uh, scheduled council meeting. So uh, when you get the agenda, um, expect to see um, a normal looking agenda. Thanks. It, we'll still have a COVID-19 update at, at the end of the meeting as well. Thanks. All right, thank you. Any questions for the city manager report? City attorney report? Uh, nothing to report tonight. All right, thank you. Uh, staff direction for members of the council. We have no future agenda items request. Is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. I'll second. It's been sec uh, moved by Council Member Orozco and seconded by Mayor Pro Tem Sandine that the meeting stand adjourned. All those in uh, Madam Clerk, please follow the roll. <laughs> Very well. Council uh, Mayor Pro Tem Sandine? Aye. Council Member Orozco? Aye. Council Member Guerrero? Aye. Council Member Ledesma? Aye. And Mayor Cabaldin? Aye. That motion carries and the meeting is adjourned. Thank you and good night, everyone. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Good night, everybody.